So I want to think about a framework um, about light as a stimulus for circadian regulation. The kind of factors that we need to think about. Uh, and essentially what we're doing is aligning the biological day with the astronomical day, and that's of course called entrainment, and if it's by light, it's photoentrainment. Um, and so the point is, for biology to function appropriately, we need the right stuff at the right concentration delivered to the right organs and tissues at the right time of day. And the circadian system provides this, this sort of um, time, this temporal architecture. And if you don't have it, uh, then our physiology falls apart. So if we think about uh, an exposure to the light-dark cycle, um, and a circadian rhythm, um, we see that under a light-dark cycle, the timing or the phase of the rhythm occurs at the same time day after day. However, if you are exposed to a weak uh, light-dark cycle and you don't get that robust signal from, from, from the environment or from artificial light, then what happens is the rhythm <coughs> continues, of course it persists, but it's now not aligned with the outside world. And when that happens, we get this, this breakdown of the circadian system um, and uh, innumerable health issues. So how is the SCN, the master clock within the brain, entrained by light? So just again to, to orientate you, if we go to the deep within the hypothalamus, here's the pituitary gland, here's the optic nerve. Just where the optic nerve comes in, you've got the suprachiasmatic nuclei, here's the optic chiasm where the optic nerves fuse, and this is the master biological clock. Um, and that master clock is entrained uh, by a direct projection from the eye called the retina hypothalamic tract. And of course, it's light that is detected by the eye, and as we'll unpack later on, the light, uh, it, it's very difficult to talk about light intensity, as I'll explain, but broadly speaking, it's brightish light for a relatively long duration that is the most effective stimulus. And of course, this is what Als van Sameren showed within the nursing home environment uh, a few years ago. By increasing the light in the nursing home, he was able to stabilize sleep-wake and indeed improve levels of cognition in those individuals who were suffering from mild dementia. So, again, as you'll be familiar, if we unpack the retina, we see the classical visual cells, the rods and the cones, the inner retina, the first stage of visual processing, and then the ganglion cells whose axons uh, leave the eye and enter the brain, uh, forming the optic nerve. And, sorry, but it's, it's complicated. And it's, the more we find out, I suppose, invariably, the more complicated it becomes. Next. And what we need to think about are the critical factors that are integrated for circadian and sleep wake timing. We need to deal with the intensity or the illuminance or the irradiance, whatever term you want to use for that, the duration of the stimulus, the color, the wavelength of the stimulus, when you see light. And <clears throat> I said dawn and dusk here, which is clearly important, but as I'll show you later on, uh, light exposure during the middle of the day can be important in the way that the circadian system responds to light. Light history, some very interesting data emerging there, and of course age, critically important to this group. And it seems, broadly speaking, that the older you get, the less sensitive the circadian system is, for reasons we don't fully understand. Okay, let's look at intensity. Is, I think, a really key point is that humans are very different from mice in terms of their circadian sensitivity. And this fooled the field for quite some time. So what the experiments we did actually quite some time ago now is we exposed mice to a light-dark cycle and then we lowered the intensity of the light portion of the light-dark cycle at a level that the mouse could no longer lock on its system. And when individuals uh, working on the human circadian system sort of try to apply this kind of lighting to humans, it failed completely. And so what sat in the literature for a very long time was that humans actually aren't really sensitive to light. It's not the primary time given. Not, not, we don't use photo entrainment. We use social cues when we eat, when we interact, as the primary means to regulate the clock. They are indeed important. Emerged in 87, and I remember being in the audience when this was presented at, I think, a, a, a Gordon conference, where Konishi Honma actually showed that humans can regulate their circadian system to the light-dark cycle. 
And this was, you know, in 87. And, and, and actually, there was a, sort of an audible gasp. People were really shocked because it overthrew, you know, these, 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 consumptive, these sort of issues that we're not, we don't use light. The light he used was eight hours of light, 16 hours of darkness, rather like those experiments in the mice. Um, and he got entrainment and alignment of the, of the circadian rhythm, rest activity, but he used 5,000 blocks. And at this point, you know, it became clear that we're weird, we're, we're different, we need a lot of light. But we'll unpack that again as we go on. So if we think, again, in this crude cartoon of the sort of environmental light levels, so here's our moonlight, and we go through to home and domestic lighting and, and office lighting, and, and I suppose Chuck Seisler would say that 90 lux, and, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, is about what you'd see in the domestic space um, of an evening. In the office, it might go to 400 or so lux, but we're in that sort of region. Whereas early morning outside, it will be 3,000 lux, near a window during the day, about 3,000 lux. And even in the UK, it can get up to 100,000 lux on rare occasions, but it can potentially get up there. And then, of course, our rods and cones are used for black and white vision, saturating at around about the 10 to 100 lux. The cones kicking in under relatively dim light, but fully functional, giving us our color vision all the way through. You know, for our visual system to work, we, we grab light and then we forget we've seen it in a fraction of a second. Otherwise, our entire life, you know, would be a, 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 a photic smear. Whereas the circadian system needs minutes and hours. Um, so, this comparison of intensity or illuminance between rods, cones and PRGCs is not really appropriate because it doesn't take into account light exposure, the duration. Milliseconds, as I said, for rods and cones many minutes for the PRGCs. Next. So, we've got this <laughs> photosensitive retinal ganglion so going to the suprachiasmatic nuclei, then via a multisynaptic, you can, wow. and so you see that there's a rhythm in pineal melatonin uh, which is entrained. So you see that this rhythm is aligned so that melatonin starts to rise approaching dusk and then falls as it approaches um, dawn. And of course, as you expand the night length, you can expand the melatonin profile. So it's a great biological marker of the, of the night. It is not, emphatically not, a sleep hormone. It is a biological marker of the dark, and it's a mild modulator of sleep. So, so basically, it's, it's, it's essentially trying to get a dose response curve of, of the sensitivity of the circadian system using melatonin suppression, uh, melato a uh, uh, melatonin phase, and, of course, they've also added subjective alertness here. But the bottom line, if we push the button, is that the threshold for... I've said PRGC, that's incorrect. It should be for circadian entrainment. Is somewhere around 50 to 100 lux, somewhere in this, in this region here. Yes, absolutely correct. But to get an effect, you have to have a light exposure of six and a half hours. So that's what, the, you know, I think this is a really important point, that you titrate duration and intensity. And, and these often get horribly confused. You can't directly compare this to the visual system uh, because of the durations that are required to actually get a response. So what we assumed when we first discovered these receptors is that this is the visual system and this is the circadian regulation and the two don't talk to each other. They are parallel streams. Well, <coughs> that's wrong because we now know the cones can talk to the PRGCs, either directly via cone bipolar cells, or rods can talk to amacrine cells, and the amacrine cells can talk to the cone bipolar, and then influence the PRGCs. So if we think about it, we see here's our wonderful melatonin response, um, uh, I'm confusing, yeah. melanopsin response, peaking at around about 480 nanometers. But there is the potential for input from the rods, the short wavelength cones, the uh, long wavelength cone peaking at 530, and the second long wavelength cone piping at, at, at 560. And so there's potentially a huge um, spectral input into the circadian system. Um, and, the, and the inputs are not necessarily additive. So, for example, uh, Daisy, working on the macaque, showed that the short wavelength cone is actually inhibitory. Um, 
uh, Manuel has, has done some work on humans suggesting that it's <coughs> not inhibitory. So, so we don't fully understand how the rods and the cones are modulating the, 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 the photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. I suppose the shorthand would be the rods kick in under dim light and the cones might be useful if the light is flickering. There's some evidence that they can be used for that. But I think we have to be sensitive to the fact that there's a potentially broad spectral insect. It's not just for 80. And time of day, <clears throat> dawn versus dusk. So here's a light-dark cycle. And this is uh, a human, as is a cartoon, and this is roughly when the individual day after day was going to sleep. If we look at dusk light, <coughs> dusk light, next, delays the clock. So you go to bed later and get up later. Dawn light does the opposite. It uh, means that uh, you will get up earlier when you see dawn light and go to bed earlier. Now, when we were all agricultural workers, and in 1800, we essentially all were, we got symmetrical exposure to light. And so we were being delayed and advanced, so we stayed basically on cue. Now, of course, within uh, our society, we aren't getting a symmetrical light exposure. And the point I want to make is getting light exposure right is critical. And this is a study led by Kate uh, Pochette uh, a few years ago now, uh, and we looked at um, university students around the world, so Perth in Australia, Auckland, Groningen in, in the Netherlands, all over. And what we found, if we look at this, is that the young people were often sleeping uh, through the morning, so they weren't getting a dawn pulse, but they were active later in the day, and so they were getting a dusk pulse. The net effect of that, of course, is that the more evening light they got, the later they went to bed. And so part of one's sleep-wake timing, one's chronotype, of course, is influenced by genetics and how old you are, but also when you see light. And, and really, one ideally should have a symmetrical exposure to light. This, incidentally, is called the phase response curve. And is, and, is, and is usually plotted in a, in a different way. But that's effectively what I'm illustrating here. Uh, so, the task. So, there's endless complexity. We've, I sort of inf implied that there's just one type of melanopsin expressing ganglion cell. Well, there's at least five in humans. They are projecting to multiple structures within the hypothalamus and the thalamus. And if we just look at this, there's a, we showed early on that the projection to the livery pretectal nuclei actually is involved in pupil constriction. So people with no rods and cones can still show a pupil constriction, which is mediated by the PRGCs. Next. Oh, yeah. Um, and then we've got the circadian system, the ventrolateral preoptic nuclei, which has been called a sleep-wake switch that has a projection, the lateral hypothalamus, very much uh, regulating sleep, driving the awake state, alertness and metabolic systems and reward has a direct input. The subparaventricular zone regulating circadian metabolic information and either directly or indirectly you've got the regulation of dopamine, serotonin and very interestingly because there are projections to the lateral geniculate nuclei and the superior colliculus you've got a modulation of visual inputs potentially by the PRGC. So it's a generalized irradiant detector system. It's not just the circadian sleep-wake systems. Um, and the next point is, oh yes, and of course, via the sympathetic nervous system, um, you can regulate next uh, pineal melatonin, but potentially many other structures via the sympathetic nervous system. So it's broadly plugged in. But the point is, as we see next, is that the assumption has been that these different responses to light will all show the same sensitivity dynamics. And that's an assumption, as we'll unpack in a moment, is, is flawed. Light history, inside versus outside. Uh, this is a study published in oh, 2011. And what it did was, was people were exposed to, um, I forget for how long, maybe 10 days, and in an environment of either the 90 lux, room lighting levels, as, as Chuck Seisler would define them, or low light, which would be one lux. And then they were given um, a, a pulse of light um, 
to see how effective the light would be at suppressing <coughs> melatonin or shifting the rhythm of melatonin. So these individuals were maintained at 90 lux and those at 1 lux. And you see that those at 1 lux showed a much greater suppression of melatonin than those who had been maintained at 90 lux. So depending upon your light history depends upon your response to the system. We'll come back. There's another really nice example of this in a moment. And again, this is the same for shifting the, um, the rhythm. Again, those that um, uh, had, were exposed to 1 lux, when given the stimulus of 90 lux, they were much uh, more sensitive to light and had a bigger shift than those who had been maintained at 90 lux. So we mustn't ignore one's light history, i.e. the history that we experience during the day. And there are some studies, again from Sizer's lab, suggesting that next, um, that healthy older adults uh, next uh, are less sensitive to light. The dose response curve is shifting in this direction. In this particular study, I should, I should flag up that there was a clear trend, but it was not statistically significant because of the variation between individuals. So the assumption is that we are less sensitive to light, and in fact there are some other studies that, that would support that, that general um, uh, idea. You mentioned the tunable dimension, and what we can see from examples of Kristen and Ed, for example, is that actually having light which is, looks warmer in the evening, for mm -hmm. example, seems to have some, and some of the work, that, I mean, most of the people in this room have seen the effects of that dynamic quality of light. Yes. And I wondered if you had some thoughts about well, that. Well, I think, I think the, um, the reason why the efflux, for example, and, and, and the screen shifts have been popular is that they're, it's more comforting, it's easier on the eye to have a, have a, a, a longer wavelength enriched stimulus in the they evening. They also dim. And they, uh, yeah, and they, they do. Dim hugely. Yeah. 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 So, so there's less glare. I, th I think, you know, photopigments are photon counters. Um, and they have a, a bell-shaped voracy response. It doesn't mean it doesn't absorb shorter or longer mm. wavelengths. It just needs more of it. Um, and so I, I think we do get a bit hooked up on, on wavelength. Mm. And if the light is dim, then wavelength is important. But if the light is bright, wavelength becomes less important. Um, that's a, in terms of the circadian system. Uh, it's probably also true for the alerting system. There are different suggestions that actually colour vision changes with age. Now that's it will do with lens transmission, and yeah. so as a result, actually people's perception of their environment may differ. Yeah. I mean, w one empirical um, measure that, that one's blue sensitivity changes with age, I can now explain why elderly women have a blue rinse. Um, had, uh, it's always puzzled me why perfectly respectable ladies will have this blue uh, hair. And it's because, of course, the yellowing of the lens filters out blue light. So when the hairdresser makes their um, hair white, it looks yellow when they look at it. And they say, oh, it looks yellow. This is hideous. Can you not make it look white? And the hairdressers know that if they tint it blue, it then looks white to a, a, an observer with a, a yellowing red. The, the, well, well the, the, I mean, part of, the, part of the reason why melatonin has been used is, is that it's always been thought of a surrogate measure for sleep. Mm. Um, you know, and if people are on beta blockers, for example, um, they produce very little melatonin. Um, and so their sleep wake is not hugely changed. It, you can probably, it, it it's probably takes a bit longer to get to sleep. Um, uh, but even melatonin supplementation in those groups has not been found to be particularly effective. Mm -hmm. There was a study uh, on quadriplegics, you know, who, who've lost sensation from the neck down, and they have severed the connection that regulates the pineal, and they show terrible sleep. And so it's assumed, ah, well, it's because they don't have any melatonin. Well, then when those studies compared it with, with um, paraplegics who have a perfectly normal melatonin, the quadriplegics were no worse than the paraplegics. It's just a, a, a fact of, of being crippled. Um, and so I think we can think of melatonin as a modulator um, of sleep, but we, we shouldn't think of it as a sleep hormone. In jet lag, for example, it can probably speed up the rate at which you lock on to the new time zone a little bit, but it's light that is actually the primary <laughs> stimulus there. Well, I, 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 I think that, the, the, as Stuart was saying, you can, you can have a perfectly normal sleep-wake profile without melatonin. So, but I do think that we, m the data suggests it will have a tweaking effect. It will have a mild modulation. Yes, the, the director 
Yeah. More generally, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's yeah. That's a really good, and that's what I cover actually a little bit in this in this in this paper because melatonin is implicated in so many different sorts of things as an antioxidant perhaps as uh, uh, ch changing vascularization. So, for example, one really interesting uh, suggestion is that melatonin at night actually causes peripheral vasodilation, and, and Anavert's Justice has, has been very active in this area, and that loss of core body temperature has a mild uh, effect upon allowing sleep induction. So it's actually the loss of core body temperature via melatonin that is actually uh, allowing you to, to go to sleep more easily. And uh, if you block that drop in core body temperature, it is indeed more difficult to go to sleep. So that might be one, one of its roles. Um, yeah, so, so and, and of course what's turned out is that melatonin is found in every group of biological life. I mean, the plants have it, some, some unicellular animals seem to have it, so it's, it's there, it's doing stuff, but we've overemphasized its role in, um, I think, sleep, would so be my, my view. We've lost a convenient shorthand. Yeah, that's right. Life I think is more so. Complicated and, and of course, the problem is, is, is that it's very difficult to get empirical measures. As Lucy, I mean, you know, you, you're thinking about this now. How do you measure sleep wake timing um, in in subjects? And of course, Lionel Troshenko here in Oxford is using non-invasive ways to measure all of these parameters. So you can have a little box on the wall and then you can, you can actually calculate sleep wake timing without any attached devices at all. So that might be something that we will be able to, to, to employ, I think, in, in the studies. Um, and melatonin has been, you know, we've done it. Um, so for example, in the studies that we did in schizophrenia, we uh, asked patients to collect 48 hours of urine every week and got beautiful melatonin profiles showing that the rhythm in melatonin was as disrupted as the rest activity cycles. So as an independent measure of, of the phase, the timing of the clock, it's really useful. But we can't think of it as one and the same. That's the problem. I mean, we've got to disentangle the circadian system from the, from the sleep-wake cycle. I mean, the, the, the individual variation for healthy adults you know, it can be six hours and you may need 10 or maybe even 11 hours. And what you have to do is define what works for you and then defend those behaviours. So trying to have a rule for everybody, it's like shoe size. It, it, it is nonsense to make everybody wear the same shoe size um, as it is to demand the same sorts of sleep parameters. Incredible variation. Um, I mean, what's so surprising about humans is we are so variable. 